All right, thank you. So uh, just to contrast with, uh, I think most of the talks we'll be seeing, this presentation isn't about like specific projects exactly, though I will mention many projects. It's more so um, a kind of train of thought covering a broad area of all the ways you can link uh, TLA Plus designs and implementations. Obviously not exhaustively. I'm sure you can call me out on something I forgot. But essentially, I'll be giving you a bit of a journey through a variety of things. So I think uh, this slide has made itself a little bit redundant with the extra bio, but just so you'll know. Um, I've, um, I'm a PhD student. I've done a couple of things that roughly inform what I will be telling you. Uh, so I've been working with Ivan and several other great graduate and undergraduate students to build the Pigo compiler. We will see this again. It's one of the spec to code solutions and that has informed some of the things I will tell you. Also, I've worked with Marcus on inconsistency and in Azure Cosmos DB, which isn't directly spec to code, but it made me write a lot of TLA plus and taught me a bunch of cool stuff, which will also inform what I tell you. So let's uh, step back to the beginning. I believe I will recreate some of the things you'll have seen on some other people's slides, but again, just have fun with more different versions of things. So what we know about TLA plus specifications, uh, you can write properties, find logic bugs, you can simulate obscure edge cases, sometimes you can write formal proofs. Most importantly for what I'm going to be talking about, you have a bunch of levels of abstraction. You can write the same specification in a variety of ways. You'll have literally seen, I think Marcus and possibly others present different specification with different suffixes for different like versionings and precisions of different con concepts. And that's great and all, that's a huge advantage of TLA+, it's really powerful, but also we have this problem that we've also seen before, which is about how do you get the implementation to actually match the specification? Yes, we are still talking about that. This is basically like an extended version of other broader, more vague things compared to what Marcus has been saying. So, first, the Kool-Aid slide with the unicorns. So if our models and implementations matched perfectly and we had somehow magical assurance that this was true, then the only bug possible would be wrong correctness properties. Now that sounds wrong, and in most real cases it is wrong, but think in the Kool-Aid for a second, and yeah, that could kind of happen. Also, um, if we know that our model is exactly representative of what's really happening. You have all these unreasonably precise monitoring tools. Like normally monitoring is relatively vague and sort of ad hoc based on what kind of visibility tools you need. But technically, if your model matches your implementation exactly, you have your entire spec as monitoring, which is pretty neat. And that's foreshadowing for some of the things I'll be talking about. And lastly, if you really get in there and blur the lines, do we even need different specification and code at that point? Can't I just like hit run on my specification and it just deploys and works? I mean, that, that sounds kind of unrealistic, but it's a nice, nice idea in principle, as long as you're okay sort of hashing out the specification and making sure it's right. So Kool-Aid aside, what are we actually gonna talk about? I'll give a quick preface on refinement. We've seen this a few times already, but these slides are a little bit different and hopefully if you're a little fuzzy on the concepts, these can give you another reference point. Then I'll summarize a bunch of existing spec to code linkage work. I will think aloud about what hasn't been tried and why, and I'll give a brief uh, teaser on some of the stuff that we're working on, but we're not really ready to claim as active projects yet. Well, they are active projects, but not like things you would try. So first, why refinement? I think we kind of know at this point, but the implementation essentially of any design that represents that implementation refines that implementation. It's kind of the underlying theory, so it's important to think about that when we're dealing with all of these trace validation matching things. So getting into refinement really quickly, one way of looking at it is imagine you have an atomic key value write, which is supposed to represent, I don't know, a key value store. We seem to like those. And that would be your specification. And on the right here, we have our implementation that does some kind of 
REST API call, a bunch of TCP junk happens, and eventually an OK happens. That's kind of like just a more detailed view of the same thing. Now, to summarize again what the conditions are for refinement, what you've got to pay attention to, um, in TLA+, Plus, we're going to be seeing a bit of instance all over the place because you've got to actually relate different specs to each other. Usually, when you're doing refinement, you're talking about multiple specs or multiple things that look like specs. More importantly, we're going to deal with matching the data. Uh, Mark has showed us some quite interesting things you can do there. And essentially, you'll end up with this question of you see this big log, and you're going to say, OK, well, which bits of this match the, implement, match the design? Eh, well, I guess the key value assignment seems reasonable. And we'll get into that more in a future slide. But that's one thing you can think of. And the other really important thing is when uh, things happened. For example, where is the write here? Is it when the OK comes back? Well, probably not, because there's a probably actually a point in the middle somewhere where the server has agreed the write has happened, and then you find out about it slightly afterwards. There's a bunch of weird kind of timing things where you have to just sort of stick the pin in the log and say, OK, here. And hopefully you're right, and if not, you have an interesting time to figure out what's happened. Now, let's dive into things a little bit. This is just a brief digression based on the Azure Cosmos DB spec work that I wrote with Marcus. You can find that online. It's all open source. Um, so ask me if you want to see everything outside the listing. But for now, don't worry too much. Just understand that there are two specs being instantiated here, A and B. A is the implementation, uh, and B is the high-level spec. And in this case, they're two instances of the same file. So. Fortunately, all the state variables are actually the same state variables. We don't have to worry about that mess right now. That's what the next slide is for. For now, um, no, that's a screen capture of my VS Code running the TLA plus plugin suite thing. But NeoVim is nice, though. All right. Oh, yes. And also, right at the bottom there, it doesn't actually get executed by TLC, but. Um, we have the theorem that the implement implementation implies the high-level spec. Um, I always get confused by the arrow, so ask me over coffee about the direction of that arrow. However, what's really important, what I thought was really cool about this, especially if you're maybe a little bit more new to TLA+, I can point out that essentially the high-level specification is a literal property of the implementation. As in, when you actually set up TLC, what you're going to say is my specification is the implementation spec, you're going to explore this, and you are literally going to check my entire high-level specification as essentially an action property. And that actually works. That was kind of a bit, what, you can do that? Yeah, I guess you can. Kind of a moment when I was learning this. So I thought that was interesting. Now, my one other little interesting thing specifically about refinement before we get into the survey of various works, mismatched variables about those. So the trick is, as we've seen from Marcus, but this is a different, very short example. Um, so you remember our dictionary from earlier, where we had a key value assignment, and then we had a bunch of weird stuff in the implementation side. So here, what you can just do is you can define what the dictionary is, just as a TLA plus function, from keys to a thing, which, trust me, is a bunch of, implement of database internals that actually executes a read and tells you what the value would be. And as a result, you get a complete view of the key values store as a function, or as if it were a function, uh, while hiding all the implementation behind this value. And what's quite interesting is once you've done that, once you've done all those definitions, you can just write equalities involving that definition. You can prime the definition. You can do relationships with it. That might sound weird if you're not used to this kind of reasoning, but I thought it's really cool that you just kind of can, and it works. These all translate to exactly the assertions you think they should be. And as you remember, you can now write a complete um, spec kind of overview of that as a property and assert it like a property and it works. And you can do all the crazy things that Marcus talked about and more. 
So that's my little commentary on refinement. Hopefully that provided an interesting kind of context, uh, especially if you were sort of wondering, okay, what is that from the several other times this has been mentioned? Now, the actual main point of this, what, how have we attempted implementation linking? Now, we've tried trace validation, which is this kind of concept of collecting structured logs and comparing them using TLA+. We've also uh, tried test case generation, uh, which is essentially to use execution traces as test scenarios, and we've seen some variations of that. We've also tried to compile the TLA+. Our group specifically has made the, the Pigo project, and I'll also be, be mentioning PlusPy and this Elixir translator that we saw a couple of years ago, I believe. And also, we have these fun runtime monitoring projects. Again, these projects aren't necessarily in production. They're more someone tried it in research at some point and told us about it. So just to not give any crossed wires relating to what other people are talking about, which might really be full production projects. So first, let's get into trace validation, and we'll cover all of these more or less. So what is it? Um, again, I think we kind of remember, but I'll reiterate. We have some existing TLA plus specification, and we have some implementation, which will produce a bunch of data, and we want to express a refinement between the two. So problem one, and again, I'm realizing you all might be having a little bit deja vu here, so I'll keep this efficient. You got the order problem. You've got a running system with a bunch of asynchronous messaging. And imagine you're getting logs A, B, and C, and you need one execution trace. But we have a lot of logs that are out of sync. So, OK, what do we do with this? Well, there's the inelegant but would technically work most of the time, sort by timestamp. Of course, if we know about clock jittering, then maybe that has issues. So instead, you can use logical clocks, vector clocks, all sorts of fun causality tracking mechanisms. This is one of the better understood parts of the problem, and pretty much any project will do something like this, because they have to, or the log comes out scrambled. The other problem, which I think is where we're going to deviate a little bit from sort of direct practicality, is more abstractly, you can run into these issues with levels of detail. Um, and not only can you have cases where you, know, you have missing data or sort of questions of where do you put logging, but you also have these strange problems of, in TLC, if you define sets and stuff, you might have a set of possible keys, and that might be like, I don't know, K1, K2, K3 or something. And then your implementation might have other data. Now, of course, you can probably plug this in various interesting ways, but it's interesting to understand that there's these weird literalisms that can come up when you're comparing the abstract spec that makes certain useful for theory, but not really what it does assumptions. So of course, obvious step one that we found doesn't work super well is logging info that actually matches. Uh, that can be either inconvenient or completely impossible. Like Marcus told us earlier, don't log your entire database contents. That's not going to work out very well. How, what we have seen is if you manually fix the gaps and the weird mismatches with TLA+, that actually works pretty well. We just see previous presentation. And one thing to think about that hasn't really been tried, but I think is kind of interesting, you could also try to use symbolic reasoning to sort of lazy fill some of these holes. So currently, we're working with like kind of explicit uh, state space exploration and just sort of figuring out certain definitions that make the two things line up, which is fine and works. But you could perhaps get away with explaining less to the verifier if you get to say, well, this variable, I don't know what it is. Learn it from the trace. What, what, what is that, actually? Or something like that. And then you can sort of accumulate the data and perform kind of less direct comparisons where some things just have gaps that get filled in or various inferences that get made. I feel like there's some interest there in terms of what we could do, but I'm not aware of anyone having tried this. Uh, maybe we'll try trying it. So to summarize in practice, and I think this is my related work slide that has the most in common with other people's. I believe, in fact, some of my slides are somehow landed exactly on what Guo cites. So we'll see how this goes. But we've heard about extreme modeling in practice at MongoDB. 
Um, there, what they did was they tried kind of a literal comparison, relatively speaking, and ran into trouble placing the, trace, the tracing statements where, the, where they worked, and maybe some of those literalisms and weird kind of synchronization troubles. And essentially, the insight there is strict direct comparison doesn't go very well for complex real-world systems. Also, in the middle, we have this fun little aside also from 2020 that went out at TLA Plus Conf. It's about, essentially, if you take your TLA Plus spec, you have your properties and your model. Now, what if the model is too hard and you don't like the sort of weird extra comparison work you have to do to make that work? Can I just use my properties and assert those over my traces? It turns out that for some classes of properties, sometimes you can just do that. You can skip a lot of the extra work of trace validation as long as your properties are roughly evaluatable on the trace itself. And lastly, uh, the immediately preceding talk showed us that you can do a great deal of really cool things by patching holes and weird messiness in your traces just with manual TLA plus, if you're careful and you think it through a little bit, that turns out to be entirely possible, albeit still a bit manual. So what are the overall trade-offs of this branch of work? So one thing that is important to remember is this is really great for catching errors that you cannot possibly model. And we'll get back to this in more detail when I start talking about compilation and stuff. But you can misconfigure your system. You can have a wrong assumption in the TLA+. Even if you did everything right, you would never catch these using just model checking because the assumptions get just taken up by the model checker and used. What if the assumption is wrong? It'll just believe you. So you can check things using trace validation by actually looking at the system that you couldn't have done using any other form of verification, including theorem proving. Of course. There's a, there's a degree of manual effort that we need, which you know leads to some ideas forming about potential future work. And it's a good question. How much of that can we automate? Uh, I know Marcus has that as well just earlier, and I think it's also a really good question. But also, there's this problem that I think we've hinted at at various points, which is this fundamentally is incomplete. If you don't see the implementation do it, it's not going to get checked. And it's still great to run this in your implementation tests. It helps. But what do we do about this incompleteness? We've also seen bits and pieces of this. Let's look at generating test cases. And I don't mean necessarily generating test code. I mean generating the scenarios, roughly speaking. So in trace validation, the incompleteness. What if we let the spec actually control the implementation? push it around, make it not just do the normal boring things. Well, this has been tried um, to some extent with some limitations. Let's go over them. Uh, the earliest one that I've cited um, is Kfabe, the informal systems folks, um, presented this technique where if you've done specification-driven development, uh, in a specific way and left a bunch of hooks in your code, what you can do is, in this case, they use the Apple HE model checker, which is also a model checker for TLA+, for those who don't know, um, to generate schedules that they would then force their implementation through to cover as much of their specification state space as possible. And they cited various limitations to this. Uh, I think they had trouble generating particularly long scenarios, but it worked out, it did the thing, and that's an example of pushing your system outside of its com pushing your implementation outside of its comfort zone to get better coverage. Another thing that you can do, which I believe was cited in this morning's keynote, which I think is kind of interesting, I also admit here to making a funny mistake, and I'm pretty sure I have an actually wrong citation in some of my work somewhere, where I cited this as if they had actually used TLA+, and for that specific paper, they actually didn't. But that's also interesting, and another tangent you can take if you want to sort of pull a bit of a different trade-off. <laughs> eh, I mean, you'll see. It, it's a trade-off, right? They did also use TLA Plus for the exact same project in a different area, so it's kind of, you can see how one might misread that. <laughs> Control F TLA Plus gives you results. Um, anyway, so to summarize what they did here, uh, they took the 
idea of TLA plus, where you write a super simplified, super like explicitly, this is what it does, and I'm not going to say anything more than what it basically should do, definitions of how their systems modules should work. And they wrote those in Rust, which is their implementation language for uh, their actual optimized production systems as well. And then they used uh, property-based um, property testing to run both the super simplified, like no optimizations, no messing around, just do what it says, um, high-level version of the system and the low-level version of the system with roughly similar interfaces and were, and were able to catch a bunch of issues by comparing the two. Now, if you think that sounds like doing that with TLA+, you would be right. It's an approximation you can do that has some benefits. It turns out they described, for example, that it was easier to explain to Rust programmers, if you know Rust. Anyway, so I thought that one was interesting. Now, the last one I have in this area is also one that was mentioned by Guo, actually. Um, they called it uh, Mock It, and that was also his third citation on his related work page. Um, anyhow, you could actually read the TLC state graph, it turns out, and gener generate a bunch of synthetic state sequences to run auto-instrumented auto real systems. Now, the sequences, fine, yes, that's just you read the state graph, it's quite reasonable to do that. What's interesting is they used a bit of implementation level Java metaprogramming to extract a bunch of methods and so forth from annotated Java code to actually derive what the actions of the system were and auto map them onto their specifications. The trade-off being they had to write their TLA plus using actions named after the methods in the Java. So it's not perfect, but it gives you this kind of interesting extra level of automation in the correspondence, which I thought was pretty neat. Now, for trade-offs in test case generation, this has a reasonable chance of ensuring your state space is actually explored. And it's, in some ways, approaches implementation model checking, which is not something I'll talk about, but you can look it up or ask me about it. It's really cool, and this has a similar effect. Um, of course, actually getting uh, these implementation behaviors and the states and stuff, it's still non-trivial, but there's some partial automation that's available, uh, although we haven't seemingly found a perfect way of avoiding all the refinement work. We've just chipped some pieces off, which is still good. And also, several of these projects happen to be Greenfields projects, which uh, otherwise you'd have to retrofit an existing system with deterministic exploration systems or something like that. We have custom schedulers. I believe someone earlier today mentioned that Rust has some really cool scheduler override technology and other languages may or may not have this. But it's a thing you can do, but it's kind of hard and not super common. So it's another thing to work with and try and reduce the impact of in terms of difficulties in actually doing this. OK, now let's flip it around. So far, these are projects where we take the implementation and we try to sort of compare it with the spec. But what if we can just kind of flip the arrow around? Instead, what if we compile our design into the implementation? That gives us great correspondence, right? Right, that's just the problem solved, isn't it? Well, no, not really. So this actually gives you a whole different world of troubles, and I'll summarize some key parts at the last part of this talk. Um, so basically, these things are data structures. In TLA+, you get some lovely mathematical primitives that are super multi-purpose and generally quite you know, effective for what they do, but they have nothing to do with how you'd actually want to write your code in an implementation. So clearly, we've got a bit of a gap here, and you've got to deal with it. Secondly, hidden control flow. It sounds a bit mysterious, and it is a bit mysterious. I think I've got a good example that I will show you, and it has to do with things that are obviously going to happen from the TLA+, plus, that if you actually wrote that in an implementation language, it wouldn't do that. There's some strange mismatches between how the control flow works. And lastly, the eternal philosophy problem even if we make it fully obvious how we can compile all the way from the specification to the implementation, does the compiler work? Um, yeah, about that. Okay. So we have some questions about that, too. Our first question 
It's an interestingly broken font. I'm sorry about that. Um, my first question, then, is about data structures. So let's have a look at this little excerpt from kind of a raft specification, kind of imaginary. We have a record with three fields that have kind of types. This is written in the style of TL plus type OK, for those who recognize that. And then you have a log, which is a sequence of records. And you might wonder, OK, what, what would that look like as an implementation? Well, the record could be like a struct. The record could be a hash table. That's acceptable in some dynamic languages. And what about the log? That's where it gets really tricky. You can imagine, oh, maybe it's a linked list. Maybe it's an array. Uh, there's actually this really cool thing called a hash array mapped try, which is a common functional language structure, which uh, is broadly quite efficient and quite appropriate as a runtime substitute for this. But remember, this is a log. When you implement logs, you have like all these specific append operations. The thing has to persist the disk. It's a bunch of crazy extra stuff. How could I possibly, as an automated program that can't read the word log, guess that from these definitions? I can't. So that's kind of a problem that you have to deal with, or just accept that we're going to throw you a default implementation that's OK, but not great. Next problem, with the hidden control flow. And thanks to Marcus for making me explain this in this way, because I think it's actually a really good explanation. So consider three nodes, node A, node B, node C. We are node B. We just received something from node A, and we're going to do a thing, doesn't matter what thing, and we're going to send something to node C. And you've got this kind of plus scale-ish critical section here, which just has three lines. Now imagine first, if you just translated that roughly to implementation code, you'd have like a channel read, some stuff like a function call, and then a network send, right? Maybe with some error handling. Even if you don't model it, that last line can fail. And we don't have any error handling in the spec, so what do we do? We just, I don't know, retry the critical section. So you read from A, do stuff, get a new message, try to send to C, it fails. You go back, you read from A, wait a second. We already read from A. There's actually been a thing removed from A's buffer now. Uh, did, should I have put it back? Yes. Yes, you should have. Otherwise, it's unsound. Because essentially, if you just write, implement this as written, you're going to write a system that forgets messages, which is really bad. So a correct implementation somehow has to remember what the original message was until it can send the, the next message and only then throw it away. And this, it turns out, is a real thing that Marcus actually found. He sent me like this uh, particular commit fixing a bug like that at one point, which I thought was really cool. So last step, what if the compilation goes wrong? Uh, well, an entirely correct system that was compiled perfectly using an archetypally perfect compiler could be misconfigured. Your model could make unrealistic sum assumptions, assume loss, ne loss this network, get a lossy network, that would cause bad things to happen, even if you've compiled it perfectly, including the hidden control flow. Or you could just have a problem in your compiler where it's buggy. For part three, it's worth pointing out that there's this whole area of verified compilation. A most prominent example is CompCert. Check it out. It's one of the most successful verified compilers I'm aware of. It's a C compiler in this case, so not for TLA plus or plus cal or whatever. But it's really good, and it's got actually good traction around for people who need really, really reliable C compilers. It's an optimizing compiler, too, so it's fascinating. But otherwise, that's not going to save you from points one and two, right? Even if with a perfect compiler, you can't escape these things. So kind of we come full circle. And it turns out compiled specifications also need trace validation, because we can't escape all these problems. So on the other hand, however, this is a compiled system. This is a perfectly Greenfields project, and we understand both, both the specification and the implementation in some mecha mechanical sense. So I think there's something to be done there. Uh, so it's not like we've lost something exactly, but we haven't perfectly won either. Now, let's talk quickly about some compiled, uh, some specification compilation projects. The most common one, and we say compilation loosely here because it's an interpreter, actually, but right under the TLA plus GitHub org, you can find PlusPy. It evaluates TLA plus actions and expressions. 
it doesn't really handle the hidden control flow problem, but if you're just kind of prototyping things out and you're aware of that, it's pretty good for what it is. We also have uh, this thing that showed up two years ago uh, right at the TLA Plus Conf, as well as one other South American conference. And it essentially TLA translates TLA Plus actions into Elixir code. Now, it doesn't try to produce production-ready code, so don't think that about it. However, it produces essentially these kind of compiled assertions. So you can, as, as long as you're okay with the translation literally doing with the state variables and everything, what the spec says, you can use that for asserting things during monitoring and like have runtime assertions. That's really neat. And this is where I bring in the monitoring because it turns out monitoring and compilation kind of go hand in hand. So I'm not really gonna explain monitoring separately. We also have Pigo, which I keep talking to you about at TLA plus conf. I guess I'm still talking to you about it. Uh, also, it was at S plus 23. And essentially, this is a compiler from a thing called modular pluscal, which I will briefly explain as it's like pluscal, but with some extra things to do with abstractions so that you can compile the thing. And it compiles it into Go with custom IO options. It has a special internal protocol to implement the hidden control flow problem, well, a solution to it. And it's been evaluated on full scale. And here, just for those people who actually work in industry, we mean like multiple nodes on big benchmark workloads, but not like in production or anything. We're a research group. Um, currently, this is the only full spec to code attempt that I'm aware of. Oops. Um, lastly, we have choreographic pluscal, which is an interesting thing. It does way more than I describe it to do here. But one of the interesting things is it compiles TLA plus actions into Go monitors for the same kind of runtime assertions effect, which I think is kind of interesting. And yeah, it seems compilation is kind of popular for monitoring implementation. But I imagine part of this is because it's a little easier to do that because you don't have to deal with all of the tricky nonsense to actually implement that. Um, but at the same time, it's also pretty neat. And that's kind of my showcase of that. Now, real quick, some of our ongoing work. I think I just got a time signal, but I only have two slides left, so. Right, ongoing work. Decal, a more customizable Pigo. So Pigo is an existing project which works well enough for compiling things in a prototyping sense, but it has a lot of cases where it will just take what you said in the spec, put it in your implementation, and let you deal with it, which is okay, it's fine as a first attempt, but you'll want to do better than that for like a really good, efficient, usable implementation. So the idea is to move implementation-oriented changes away from the specification and sort of put them somewhere else. So one key problem that I got to in my slide about the data structures is Pigo uses fixed data structures. It uses a simple, good enough immutable data structure system, which, you know, works, but it can be inappropriate. For example, the log structure. That was a real thing we had to do in our evaluation system where we had to go out of our way to work around its decision of using that and do some other weird stuff instead. What if we had a constraint system where we could describe to not Pigo, like decal I suppose, um, what we actually wanted our data structures to look like? This, this function is a hash table. This function is a struct. You know, that kind of thing. Secondly, Pigo's implementation of hidden control flow is a black box thing, and it's kind of fixed. It works, but there's a lot of things it doesn't understand. For example, if you're writing an implementation, you might try to write an IO select. Pigo does not understand what those are, and there is no nice way to make that actually happen. So, more constraints. Essentially, decal is Pigo, but with a slightly improved input language and a constraint system to be able to actually explain what you mean by certain more vague TLA plus constructs. Now, if we have refinement, you can make a more precise, precise spec, and that would be nice, but there's a point where you just want to say, this means this, and otherwise it's exactly like I wrote it. So that's what decal's supposed to be, and hopefully you'll see that eventually. The other idea is trace check, which is compiler-assisted trace validation. We've got a lot of manual effort, and we discovered that compiled code still needs trace validation because it turns out that we cannot escape from the problems that I described. So the idea is essentially do trace validation on the compiled system, 
and use as much of the compiler to automate trace validation workflow as possible. The compiler knows a lot of things that a spec and an implementation next to each other wouldn't directly imply. And the design challenge here is to figure out how many of those things there are and what we can make them do. So that was all I had to say. Shout out the Pigo project, check out the QR code and my lovely logo. Um, we've talked about all these various things. Hopefully you kind of learned something. Any questions? Thank you, Finn. That was a, a very informative presentation. Um, any questions from the audience? What do you use for parsing? Um, in which project? Uh, both of them, I guess. Um, Sorry, I mean like uh, decal and Pico. Um, okay, so Pico is the one that has an actual code base. Decal is more a pile of ideas and loose prototyping, so I'll describe Pigo for you. Um, Pigo uses um, parser combinators with some customizations just for rapid prototyping purposes. These are, these are research projects, so I try to stick to things that are easy to edit, even if it might be a little slower or occasionally annoying to work with. But yeah, parser com. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, we have our own, Pigo has its own parser of some decent part of TLA plus, plus cal, and our modular plus cal su superset. And if you really want to use it, I can show you how. It's actually available on the internet. Any other questions? Yeah, thanks, Finn, for the talk. Um, I've heard that AI is going to be big. And to what extent do you see it plays a role here, generating the implementation, generating the specification? Um, I think the issue with AI, generally speaking, is you can get some really kind of effective results where you take a bunch of like stuff humans wrote and you try to get like a plausible output. But there's a difference between plausible output and actually provably correct output. So I think there's a lot of opportunities f to get AI to generate an initial kind of bash at a thing that works. And we could either use compilers to give com the AI a simpler output language so it has less you know, state space to deal with, and or we can use more verification to try and match kind of what the compiler was, what the AI was supposed to do with what it actually did. And I think there's a lot of interesting interactions there. Do you see much difference between runtime monitoring cloud there and the trace validation cloud there? You listed um, them separately. Um, there is some difference. Uh, there are things you can do offline and there are things you can do where you instrument the implementation in a way that would make no sense for a production run. Whereas there are things you might have to do specially to deal with uh, runtime monitoring of an actual running system where you can't perturb it too much and you have to like log things. If, I, I feel like they have different kind of set overlapping but different sets of limitations. So I listed them as separate ideas even if many of the concepts are related. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I just kind of made up these categories so I don't think about them too hard. We have one more question. Like, uh, I, I, it's more like a response to Murad. Uh, so runtime monitoring, since it's an assertion, it, ha it can't uh, access the global state, which logs technically can because it's offline. Also fair, yes. Let's give Finn another round of applause. Thank you.